take his hands off. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Ray Benson. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We'd like to welcome everyone here to the Whitliff Collections at Texas State University in San Marcos, where we are celebrating the career of Ray Benson and a great e exhibit that we have here called Ray Benson 50 Years. And we know we've got viewers from around Texas, United States, and the world on this event, Ray, so we're honored to have you, and it's, it's a thrill, really. No, thank you. The thrill is mine. I mean, this is uh, quite an honor and, and, a, and very humbling experience to see you know, a, a large portion of your life in, a, in a, a, such an incredible collection, museum, whatever you want to call the Whitliff here. And uh, so, uh, yeah, it's a wonderful feeling to uh, be surrounded by not, not, my, uh, not only my stuff, but just the incredible stuff, the Lonesome Dove stuff. It's just amazing, the photographs, et cetera. Well, by w ways of introduction, I'm sure you need none, but just in case there's some folks out there don't don't realize, Ray Benson is a towering icon of Texas music, an ambassador and survivor over the course of more than 50 years. He and his band, Asleep at the Wheel, carved out a hard-earned Grammy-winning niche as the embodiment of the adventurous spirit and music traditions of Bob Wills and his Texas Playboys and so much of Americana and Roots music. And as far as Grammys, 10 Grammys, that's a lot of Grammys, with when you count the music of the Sleep at the Wheel, Ray Benson's Grammy, they even won a Grammy for uh, artistic, I think, uh, art for artwork, so it's 10 Grammys, fantastic. And Sleep at the Wheel did so by riding the country rock and outlaw country wave of the late 1960s and early 70s, but with a very youthful and young sort of love of the pure western swing country rock and roll jazz boogie woogie and texas blues that you threw into that sound um, it helps when you have a persona like rays that's bigger than life and who has a, a flair for fun and good times and putting people on the dance floor and uh, in the seats that's the cherry on top so here at the whitliff collections we celebrate him and you know we have his archives here it's a, a massive archive it's a really wonderful collection and like Jerry Jeff Walker, you know, Ray was originally an outsider to Texas, but uh, the self-described Jewish Yankee hippie from Philadelphia <laughs> quickly became a beloved Austin institution. And really, to me, I have so much admiration for Ray beyond friendship because in many ways he is the, you know, when it comes to what Texas music sounds like or looks like, you think of Asleep at the Wheel, often, just like right up there with all the greats. So um, we celebrate him, your archives, and of course your recovery from COVID-19, which made it all too real. So Ray, this is your life a little bit, maybe <laughs> 50 years and 50 minutes or so. So let's start with something around that time. We're not going to walk you through the whole story of, of his life. No, we're going to bounce not. around <laughs> and have some fun. <laughs> no, but one thing that ha jumps out at me from your archives and even from the book that you know, 50 years ago, Asleep at the Wheel, you know, you set off to look for America. What did you find? What did you find as a young man? Well, um, we, I, we found uh, the most diverse and strange uh, place you could imagine because um, the, in 1969, when we formulated the band, and by March of 1970, I actually had the band, um, the interstates weren't done. Regionalism was still uh, pretty much the, the lay of the land in America. Um, and so there was still vestiges of the old rural America, which is what America was, you know, turn of the century, certainly, and in the 30s and 40s. So um, that's what we were looking for. And so where did we head? Pawpaw, West Virginia. <laughs> <laughs> And all of the, and that's the other thing about is it, our career. It's really all the circumstances. It's, just, it's a bunch of mistakes that to turn uh, into opportunities. You know. Um, no, I was going to be a film film director. I was going to make films, and I went to Antioch College, which has a work study program, because Rod Serling was teaching there, right. uh, and uh, the the quarter I went, he left. <laughs> so. <laughs> 
And uh, so I had a really good time. But the next quarter, I, w I went to, I got a job in New York City as an apprentice editor with Eli Landau, a very famous uh, uh, producer, did the, the Pawn Broker and Long Day's Journey. And he was making a Martin Luther King documentary. So I, and I knew how to operate equipment, you know, the movieolas, they were called. And I was just very lucky, got this job, and I was all set up to be an editor in, in New York City with a union card and everything, and I said, nah, I think I'll start a band in West Virginia. <laughs> <laughs> let, me, yeah. let me ask the flip side of that coin. Uh, what would your report on the state of America be like if you set off today as a young man? What do you think? I mean, how, how different is it? What would, you know, how has the technology changed? What, what are you saying? He, he still lives on the road. I mean, what, 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 how different is it? Well, you know, back then, the reason I stopped becoming a, 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 a filmmaker uh, was because I'm ADD, and, and it was like te the technology was so cumbersome, it would take 10 years just to, to do the whole thing, and you write a song and sing it that night, and boom, there you are, you know. The technologies were, were, um, were um, so, you know, compared to today, primitive. I mean, come on, you know, the, when, when the, the big deal for us was when the fax machine came out. It was like, <laughs> I mean, good God Almighty, you're on the road 250 days a year, and your agent says, oh, uh, uh, the guy at the club says, well, I sent the check to the agent, and it's, um, and of course the agent sends the check for, you know, a thousand dollars less than the, the guy said or something. It was just incredible, and of course cell phones was just ridiculous. Uh, what 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 we, what we could do it it meant, you know, uh, that you could stay in touch. Before that, it was packed full of quarters. I mean, there's stories of you being left at truck stops, right? Oh and yeah, like oh all yeah. kinds of stuff. Oh and yeah, oh yeah. No. <laughs> And I drove the bus for a number of years because I uh, didn't have enough money to pay a driver, you know, but we had the bus. And uh, so, n no, it, it, to get where you want to go on this uh, uh, business, you got to sacrifice a lot. You got to, you got to, you know, sleep on hard floors <laughs> and <laughs> pay your dues, as we like to say. Uh, all in the names of playing music and having a great time, you know, <laughs> and, it, and it really is. And, and of course, you got to be young to do it. Um, so you better yeah. uh, progress a little bit as you get older. And you got to love it because early asleep at the wheel and throughout your career, you, it's obvious. But, you know, from the vantage of our archives and from the Whitliff collections, I mean, some of the most amazing artifacts in those archives of yours are those old daily calendars that you held on to from the 1970s. I mean, they reflect that those were lean times. I mean, lean, mean times sometimes. So. You know, and during that first decade, it's amazing to when you really look at the numbers. You're working 250, 300 days a year. Uh, how did you survive? And kind of what runs through your mind when you think? You know, I remember that day that you came and looked at those calendars. I mean, when you really ponder how little you were making and how hard you were working. Well, you know, the, in the very earliest in that thing, it was a communal band, so we all lived in the house, one house, and shared the money to buy groceries and uh, and put gas in the car to get to the gig. So, you know, that's how it was. And it really, you know, you, it, it, you know it was like, A, joining the Army, and B, having a family, uh, you know, be, and that was what it was. That doesn't, th that never lasts long. I mean, you know, you get people in and out of that kind of situation because it is, you know, you have to live by a set of rules that, that are just insane, you know. <laughs> you have to be available all the time, you gotta rehearse, you gotta be compatible musically and and personally with a bunch of people and and by golly, now you gotta live with them and be broke all the time. So <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but Who wouldn't do that? I mean, <laughs> golly. But are there a couple of incidents or one that just makes you shake your head like just, whoa, that was uh, what, that, really that's wild. A, Wild or, or Crazy, I've had enough hard, of this. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Every oh, that's a lot of egos in that little. Oh, uh, well, the West ego Virginia. part. I wasn't even talking about the <laughs> ego part. I, I mean, the, the ego part's a whole nother other thing. Is, uh, but uh, the daily living, that, that, that we got to remember, this is 1970, 71, 72, 73, around that time. Um, you know, the social situation was, first of all, Vietnam. Okay, so I was 18, 19, and you know, draft eligible, and so was Lucky and Leroy. What was 
w one of the determinants of this band was that they had the lottery that year, and I pulled 256. I'll never forget the number. <laughs> And uh, Lucky pulled 258 and Leroy too, so it was up there. And so we were said, oh, okay, well, at least we're not going to go to Vietnam. And um, so I started that uh, routine. And the, the, you, you weren't around, but the political situation in 1969, it was us and them. Gee, it sounds familiar. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, us was um, hippie, long-haired kids who didn't want to go to Vietnam and had uh, helped or, or been sympathetic with the civil rights music, and them was them. And they liked Merle Haggard singing Okie from Muskogee, and the hippies liked the Grateful Dead, Rolling Stones, etc. And here we come, you know, hair down here, uh, hitting and basically hippie-looking guys, but we played Merle Haggard's music. <laughs> and that was the... Um, that was what was you know, really culturally significant because what that led to was us coming down here and from the other side of the sociological s spectrum, Willie Nelson, who uh, then had, had you know, been, as Doug Somm used to say, psychedelicized and came <laughs> over said, and all of a sudden we all met it uh, in Austin, Texas and created this, um, you know, they called it outlaw thing, progressive country thing, whatever. Um, it was a reaction to uh, the, really, the political situation uh, made manifest by music, right. you know. It was, it was, it was uh, you know, looking back on it, but, you know, when we did it, it was just uh, how are we going to get somewhere where we fit in and we're not going to go to jail. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that was, that was the masterstroke, right? Because, I mean, that move from the Bay Area, that you, you know, you're out there, to Austin on the re recommendation of Willie Nelson and Doug Somm. Uh, that was the magic stroke. I mean, how, I mean, you were playing great music before, but how, how different did it feel playing your music in front of Texas audiences? Did it, I mean, did it start to make more sense? Oh, yeah. Well, they danced to it. Uh. <laughs> in, in Berkeley, it was like, it was, they were like, <laughs> wow, what is this? I mean, was the move inevitable? Did you think that you were going to eventually end up in Texas, or, or, or was that just... Well, we knew we wanted. We knew that our heroes were down here, but uh, we didn't know we'd be accepted until when we got here and played. Uh, I'll tell you, it's it's very interesting. So we played at Armadillo and then gotten around to start playing Soap Creek School and everything. But one interesting thing is, remember, we're playing down there off of Sixth Street, but not when it was it wasn't Sixth Street then, but it was <laughs> it was Sixth Street down by the cop station there, and uh, there was a small club, and we played, and a guy and his dad were there, and they. They said, hey, we want you to play our uh, gig out. It's down out, uh, out in Driftwood. And I said, okay, great. And, and it, was the, uh, it was the old Confederates reunion. A lot of folks don't know about it. So it was the Ken McC Ben McCullough Road, which has now got a numbered name, goes out to the Salt Lake and right across there. For like, what, hundreds of years, they've had the uh, old Confederates reunion. Now, of course, there are no Confederates left. And it's not, you know, at, at this point, I'm kind of, it's, it's certainly not a political thing. This was a bunch of families that were, that were descendants of Confederates, I guess. But the point is, in 1974, the old man and his kid were like, you're the only band that, uh, that the folks and the kids are going to like, you know, <laughs> at the old Confederates reunion. So they had a bunch of Jews out there playing for them. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, yeah. yeah, well, you know, the Confederacy, it was, it was the black people had the problem with the Confederacy, obviously. No, I, it, it's just very interesting because uh, that was, showed the, the, that the music brought them together. You know, the music was, all right, you know, we might be, you know, going through this generational, it was called a generation gap, I don't know if you remember, it was, and it was real. And it was centered around uh, all of the, the generational things that happened. And uh, so anyway, but for a short period of time, the music really did uh, help soothe that thing. And at the center of all that is this lanky kid. It, you can look at all the classic photos in the ex exhibition. How much did you weigh back then, Ray? And then also, I, I couldn't get the shirts. I couldn't get the shirts to fit on the forms. The museum, the the sleeves hang off the forms. So I mean, what, what's, what's your sleeve length? I'm, I, uh, yeah. America wants to know. <laughs> Send shirts, 39 and a half, please. Oh, wow. 
Well, I was a good ball player. I was a really good basketball player because I had ups and I could dunk and I, and I had long arms and I was, uh, but I was slow. Uh, <laughs> and uh, that's, that's, that's what happened with my basketball career. I mean, <laughs> And so, th but, uh, so then you, you convince uh, Pam Ware and other folks to start making it. I mean, it seems that early on, even the rag tag asleep at the wheel had a sense of destiny. And also, you were thinking in terms of a logo, we've got the, your, your well, tattered jeans. We had jean a sense of there. style. style. There. There yeah, we were yeah. stylish. There you go. We were ragged but right, as okay. the song goes. <laughs> no, yeah, well, for instance, we had those... Uh, Everybody got a denim jacket, and at the time, everybody had a girlfriend who could embroider, and they embroidered these incredible jackets. I think that's in the, in the exhibit. Yeah, yeah Sleep at the Wheel, like motorcycle-type jackets, and, and, and we had them, and, and so, we, you know, you looked like you were a, a motorcycle gang. And I mean, we, it, you know, I look at those pictures, yeah, you know, well, and we had tattoos and stuff. I guess that's the way, uh, there were smaller tattoos back. You see, they were really small. <laughs> And I show the kids the tattoos nowadays. I said, see this tattoo? That was bright and shiny in 1977. <laughs> <laughs> and I see these big arm tattoos. I go, man, you're going to look like a big blue arm. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. What was the question? No. <laughs> perfect. Perfect. You know, um, and for those that aren't familiar, like with your, your solo albums and some, and some of your songwriting, you know, that sometimes falls in the cracks. I mean, you know, your, your image is I in A Slip of the Wheel is of musicality and good time, the dance floor filling. But, I mean, um, you know, your exhibition and one of the beauties of, of the archives is that for, for researchers, for authors, yeah. they can learn the, the, the truth is more complicated, right? There's twists and turns to the story, sometimes dark times. I mean, do you ever, uh, you know, we, uh, everyone in this audience, you know, knows A Sleep at the Wheel. I mean, we're familiar with that image. Do you ever feel a little bit typecast as a sort of happy-go-lucky guy, the leader, we're going to get through it, or, uh, or... Well, it's, it's better than being a morose, uh, you know, well. <laughs> a manic depressive, <laughs> 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 of which there are plenty of songwriters like that. Uh, yeah, um, well, image is, is so important. I mean, like Haggard Merle and, and Johnny Cash and those guys, and, and Willie even, who, who sort of w did it unconsciously, but y you have an image, and that's, that's, that's part of what show business is, you know. Um, some of it's real, some of who you are, and some parts of it are real, and parts of it made up, you know. Um, but uh, um, no, it doesn't, doesn't bother me. If uh, people want to project on you, that's great. That just means they know you. <laughs> if you're in show business and you are, and you are at all uh, uncomfortable with people looking at you or talking to you or jumping on you, then you're probably in the wrong <laughs> business because, I mean, the, co the COVID thing has kept people from jumping on me, but <laughs> other than that, yeah. And, uh, oh, he's picking up the guitar, folks. This could it's be good. Right, yeah, so, you know, along that same lines, I mean, few musicians anywhere, really, whether it's uh, here in Texas or anywhere, really wear as many hats as you do or uh, as naturally. Because I don't have any hair. <laughs> <laughs> naturally outgoing or have the capacity. That's really, you know, when you really delve into the Ray Benson story, it's, it's this capacity and ability to get beyond simply only playing the guitar or only writing songs. I mean, he's, he's an advocate for musician, philanthrop philanthropic causes. Where does that come from? I mean, was that instilled by your parents from your Quaker education? I know you went to some Quaker schools. I mean, where does that sense of giving back come from? Yeah, old Gerald Mann, he was the preacher there at the Baptist church that, uh, off of 360 one time. And, and we had met him, we were talking, and he asked about my background. I said, well, I'm uh, Jewish, but I, you know, I, I went to Quaker schools, and I went. He said, "A Quaker Jew? I've never seen such a thing." <laughs> went, yeah, but uh, yeah, uh, well, uh, yeah, the Quaker thing was wonderful. I mean, the Quakers were just because the uh, the Friends Service Committee. I would do stuff with them. They just do community projects, and yeah, you know, the Jewish thing about a mitzvah is you you know, is that you should do good deeds, and so okay, that's just part of the deal, and. Um, being in show business or being on stage or being a, a, some sort of personality, you have a, a lot of opportunity to do that. So 
that's can, where before at. you start, can I do something? I've always, want, I've always wanted to be a roadie for Ray Benson. I want to adjust that mic for him. Oh, no, this is fine. This is fine. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, you'd be a terrible roadie. <laughs> well, I tried to dress for the part today, Ray. Darn it. No, okay. and, that's a, and, that's, and that's good advice. All right. <laughs> This is a and this is a cool guitar. This, is a, this guy in England did it, and I actually have a pair of boots that uh, match that. <laughs> oh, wow. I couldn't wear them because I, you have to walk too many stairs here. <laughs> and it sounds perfect too. Wait, go ahead. You were asking something. I always I'm just no. Before you start, since you're strumming chords, you know one of the things. I mean, with uh, Western swing, I mean the the, the A6 and the the ninth chords. I mean, what is it that makes it sound? What does it make swing sound so different? Or what is it, what is it? Is there you want a music theory lesson, or, or well, maybe give that's us really an boring. Well, I don't know. Give us an example of it. Or uh, no, 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 no. Western swing is just music that is a string band basically, fiddles, uh, steel guitar, guitar, piano, bass, drums, and um, and they played the music, uh, rhythms of the day, which was swing music, Benny Goodman, uh, 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 you know, right. Glenn Miller, uh, Dorsey Brothers, etc. And the reason was, was people wanted to dance, and so to, they knew how to dance to that kind of music, and Bob Wills and, and dozens and dozens of bands just all went, well, we'll play that music, it just, we don't have four horns, four trombones, four trumpets, et cetera, you know. And then it had, it became, you know, it, it organically became its own kind of music uh, by just uh, 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 playing, you know, and, uh, and the musicians were so creative that uh, they came up with um, the virtuoso playing, you know. And I'll tell you a story, uh, uh, Clint Eastwood, I had dinner with him one time, and, and and I was doing the Bob Wills play that, that we did uh, called A Ride with Bob. And me and Ann Rapp had wrote this play. And it's funny because I went over to Whitliff. I said, uh, I, I, I had this idea. It was Bob Wills' 100th birthday. And I went to Whitliff. I said, hey, uh, Bill, I, I want to do this thing. And, and his assistant was Mike Levy's daughter, right? Yeah, yeah, Mara. And uh, I said, I need somebody to write this uh, play for me or with me. <laughs> And uh, and they both said, "Oh, Ann Rapp." And we went, "Oh, okay. Well, who's she?" And uh, so we did. But um, what was the beginning part of this question? Play us a song. Right? No, I was talking <laughs> about the Bob Wills play. And so we, uh, you know, getting to uh, figure out um, swing music was and what what Western swing was was telling the story of Bob Wills and hundreds of great musicians in Texas that um, were sophisticated you know, uh, jazz swing players who then, uh, you know, uh, made this music really uh, legitimate and, and hot. And Clint Eastwood said to me, he said, he was 18 years old and was working for Weyerhaeuser up in Oregon. And he had heard that there was a, a cowboy band uh, playing. And he said, I wasn't much into uh, Western music, uh, but he said, there'd be some pretty girls there, so I went down, and it was Bob Wills and his Texas Playboys, and then Clint said, he said, yeah, them boys could play. <laughs> 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 right. Anyway, yeah, well, you know, and, and then, of course, blues. You know, everybody knows blues here is Chicago blues, but the blues out of, out, of, uh, out of New Orleans and Mississippi was more of a jazz blues, and so, like, Bob did a lot of those off-colored uh, uh, double entendre tunes, you know, like, with everybody, oh, four or five times. Oh, four or five times, maybe tonight doing things right, four or five times, maybe I'll try, and maybe I'll die, but I'm going to try, I'm going to try four or five times. Oh, little, 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 oh, you know, hey, oh, hey, oh, I need, and that's like Cab Calloway stuff, and, <laughs> and uh, put a fiddle or two in it, and it's really cool, so, um. To me, it was just, uh, you know, I grew up playing every kind of music. I played upright bass in the swing band in, 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 co in high school, and tuba, and the marching band, and Dixieland band. You know, and um, so it all just seemed to fit. And, uh, I, 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 when I was a kid, uh, I'd go to New England in the summer, and uh, Sally and I would talk about that, and they had a square dance band, and I would play guitar 
with Yankee fiddlers, um, and, uh, and they were so similar to the Appalachian and uh, fiddlers, uh, just had different names, a little different attitude. But then I got to Texas, and Texas fiddling is, is a whole different thing, and that's because it had that swing influence. Even the country fiddling, which is now a real recognized kind of uh, Texas style fiddling, um, had its uh, uh, owed a lot of its uh, uniqueness to the Bob Wills thing. It was uh, the Beaumont Rag was a huge hit, and and it was kind of in it, it defined Western swing. I think if anybody wanted to have a record that defines Western swing, Beaumont Rag, even though it has no s lyrics, it, it has the rhythm, and it's and it has the uh, fiddle background of the you know, and uh, that'd be a good start. And, it, and, it's, and it's fair to say, too, Asleep at the Wheel, from the beginning and throughout the career, always had all these different elements, I mean, of country, boogie, rock, swing, right? I mean, it's, it, and blues, it's, and jazz. And sometimes, I mean, I mean you did have a, a country top ten, but, but all those other elements, I mean, it wasn't straight country, right? I mean, it kind of worked against you no. a little bit in the commercial sense, perhaps. But you bet we had it. I mean, we had a big hit on the letter that Johnny Walker read. Right, that's what I mean. That's what I'm saying. But up here, but country, right? Yeah, because we all, and, 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 yeah, that was, I mean, yeah, I'll tell you what, yeah. We, uh, we, we, that was a top 10, that's our only top 10 uh, chart record, you know, single. And um, it about ruined the band because <laughs> it was, it, you know, it's a very, it, it, we wrote it and thought that Dolly Parton and Porter Wagner would do it, that, but they didn't. So we did it, thankfully, and it was a big hit. But, uh, but the band at the time was a 10-piece band, and we were playing swing music, Count Basie tunes, Bob Wills tunes, uh, all kinds of Louis Jordan, you know, Choo Choo Boogie, Ain't Nobody Here But Us Chickens, all that kind of stuff. And we go on these shows with uh, uh, Donna Fargo, the, you know, the happiest girl in the whole USA. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and uh, you know, really straight country acts, and you have 30 minutes, and we had three singers, and so we get everybody gets one song, and, and then we play a swing instrumental, and then, then the audience going, I remember playing with Barbara Mandrell one time, and it was like, you know, we were doing this jazz instrumental, and it was like, you know, the audience was like, what is going on? I one time in, in Atlanta, Georgia, you know, playing a real redneck joint, and I don't know, we would gotten into something weird, and the, the owner of the club, some little old lady screaming at us, you know, <laughs> that ain't country music. <laughs> yeah. But... In, in your memoirs, there was a line that jumped out of me, and I always remember this. It's a, there's a passage in the book. And so you, you, this is a quote, sleep at the wheel has always been about going behind enemy lines to spread good vibes. So is it fair to say maybe your ability to play all this different style of music, maybe some people understood it didn't, but it kind of lets you go, you know, now yeah. there's what we call <laughs> Red State, Blue State, but you could be anywhere. Right? Oh, we yeah, we were, yeah. I mean, listen, one time, it was 1975, I think, maybe 76, and uh, the folks in Baton Rouge said, hey, we want you to play uh, this old radio show down in, um, in southern Louisiana. We said, all right, so we go down. Now, at the time of the band, there were, let's see, there was about a 90s band. There were uh, three Jews, one Catholic, a Creole, half black, half Indian, and then a couple, that was, that was about the minority situation. <laughs> So we pull into the place, and um, the sheriff come on. He looked like Rod Steiger in the heat of the night. <laughs> he said, well, so good to see you boys here. We love that Bob Wills music y'all do. I said, great. And I look over to the right, and there's a giant cross made out of drill pipe outside the, the, the club. And I go, what, what's that for, sir? He said, oh, we got tired of putting wood ones up. We just drape, drape it in burlap and soak in gasoline and light it. And so this is a Ku Klux Hello. Klan hall. <laughs> and we're like, oh, and Tony, uh, who was a, a bass player, he's been with Bob Dylan now for like 30 years, and he had an afro. And he ran in the back of the bus and got a cowboy hat and shoved it <laughs> on his head. <laughs> we played our 45 minute set and got the hell out of there. And, and yeah, no, we've, uh, and, and we have had fights happen at, at some of the rowdy places in East Texas and stuff. But, it, like, we have a lot of photographs in the exhibition. I mean, your friends, you know, played events for President Bush, for President Obama, for the Clintons. I mean, it, is your music always feels kind of bipartisan, or at least a sleep at the wheel feels like it may. We know 
uh, your, li your political leanings, but it feels like a sleep at the wheel can fit in. Yeah, yeah. Despite no, that, yeah, I mean, it's a absolutely. bridge builder, perhaps. Yeah, absolutely. Is that too ambitious you know, to say? You know, you don't show your, uh, you know, I don't ask you who you voted for when you come see us, and, and it's your problem, and uh, we just, you know, we just feel that, uh, that if we can't party together, um, that, that there'll be, that there are serious problems, and there already is, obviously. You know, people who can't uh, gather socially because of their political affiliations, that's sad. Um, it's, it's always been that way. I mean, in America, you, you know, you can go back and fist fights among political peoples. Obviously, it was a frontier favorite here. And uh, duels, I was, it was in New Jersey the other day, <laughs> and I get out, we were across from New York City, and we were standing across from the city, and, and that's where uh, Aaron, the Burr uh, duel was, and there was a statue and a thing on the, uh, on the duel, that that's where it was fought. And I thought, how stupid. <laughs> <laughs> That was a dumb one. You know, but he got a Broadway show out of it. <laughs> ha Hamilton. <laughs> well, I if you haven't heard it, Ray's made a great record lately. He's got an album coming out with, uh, and the single with Wild Love. It sounds great. I mean, you've played. Do you want me to, you want, you want me to sing that song? Is that a YouTube? No, well, you, you could. What do you I'll think? I'll what do you think? Should I sing a song? You had enough of this jabbering. <laughs> no, 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 no. That's <laughs> I don't mean that, uh, but uh, what I mean is uh, you've played with so many great musicians, recorded with them, opened with them, you know, toured with them. I mean, are there some that just stand above all others, and who are the ones that maybe got away that you kind of wish uh, well, list sort of musicians? You know, Willie, of course. I've done more, more music with Willie Nelson than anybody else. And I got to sign the guitar. I mean, <laughs> you know, that, that's, that was top of the line for me. So when you're making a record and you call, a, will everybody take your call and they're automatically in? You always have some great guests on those, on those albums. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, yeah. And I produce other people's albums and stuff, so you know, I know how to run the levers. Right. <laughs> and speaking, let me ask you that because Ray does wear a lot of hats. I was going to get to that, but as a record producer and for young, you know, the Whitliff Collections does hope to inspire young people and you know that's really I know Bill was really about that like learning how to do it you know that the greats it, it takes a lot of hard work but from with your record producer cap on what is it that is essential for an artist you know what are you looking for when you're making a record like if you were advising a young person what are they what is it that they need to get across besides a great song oh um, you know, everything's different. Everybody's different. Everything's different. It's, uh, it's different every time. You know, you go in with an artist that's uh, a singer, or you go in an artist that's a songwriter, or you go in an artist that is a uh, instrumentalist. It's just different every time. You, you walk in the room and you feel it out and, and you sing. Some people need to be coached. Some people need to just have a, a setting, you know, to right. dim the lights, get comfortable, and go for it, you know. But as a young guy, y you had a dream, right, of, of hopefully Van Morrison producing something for you. It kind of, it, or collaborate. It seemed like it always was no, just it a wasn't little a, bit it elusive. Wasn't a with dream. No, no. Van wanted to. Oh. We we didn't. Uh, no, <laughs> no. We Van, out of the blue, called us up and said, "Hey, I want to produce your record and put us on a bunch of shows. Mention us in Rolling Stone. That's how we got a deal." But we, we just didn't think that Van was going to do, and we were right, and we went to Nashville and did the thing. But uh, what was your point? But, he w <laughs> but I mean, when he, uh, well, put it this way, when, uh, whether, you know, whether it came from him, right? So was there an idea, wow, this could be the break we needed? You know, I mean, you know, he dropped your names a few times, just almost a way like Dylan dropped the Sir Douglas Quintet's name in, in an interview. Well, yeah, I mean, but that's that, we, we understood the process of getting famous, yeah, you know, you, you the, when you start out, you got to create a scene. You got to do stuff. Show business is great because you can, you can, you, you know, you can, you, you can try to fake people out of it. You can, you know, you just do what you got to do to get no, noticed. You know, there's great stories about, you know, what the the, the publicity stunts that people to do, like, uh, you know, that um, the, the Colonel Tom Parker, the huckster that managed Elvis, or you know. And the, the crazy stuff that, you know, pain, pain, uh, little girls would go up and scream for Elvis, you know, and go, oh, that, and people go, that really happened? Yeah, that really happened. And, you know, the, the, uh, the, uh, when Robert Mitchum was arrested for uh, smoking pot in 1950, he went to jail for a small period of time, and he got out of jail, and they said, what was jail like, Robert? He said, like show business without the riffraff. <laughs> 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 
and so, you know, <laughs> when you're dealing with, especially the lower the level you got, you're dealing with some, you know, with criminals, with hucksters, with wannabes, and, and it's, uh, it's a, it's, 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 you know, it's, it's a great movie, and it's, a, it's like, it's an, um, but it's, you know, it's, you, know, you can get hurt, and you can get screwed, and I mean, but sh it's, it's like I keep telling people, you know, when you're 19, 20, 20, and you're 20, it's, it's lifestyle, you know, you're out there, if you have the ability to play, and, and you have the creativity to create, and then it's lifestyle, it's like, okay, you know, like people don't, you know, I'm 70 years old, people, uh, you know, uh, call, I say, what time should I call you? I said, call me at 8 in the morning, he said, oh, you probably don't get up till noon, I said, no, <laughs> I said, Kids don't get up till noon, <laughs> you know. Seventy-year-old men get up to pee, you know. <laughs> <laughs> We've had some yeah, shows was, like yeah, that here. Right, right. <laughs> I can recall. You can say pee on the internet, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, but that hard work and that even for a young person, I mean, it takes a toll. I mean, that exodus of musicians in that first period, you know, from the original lineup, and yeah, you know, was, which yeah. included, you know, your, your, you know, your, your childhood friends leave. You yeah, it was kind of, it was kind of heartbreaking that thing. But you know, you get over heartbreak and move on. And, right. uh, and what it's turned out to be, having like a, you know, over ninety musicians in the band, what it turns out to be is that you, uh, um, it's the greatest thing in the world because you get to work with so many talented people. Uh, you get to also influence so many people in terms of how they approach music and everything, and uh, and it's it's just a joy, you know, working with young people as you get old is what it's all about. Uh, when we were young, we met all the old Texas Playboys and all the Western Swing musicians and old R&B guys, and it was you know, it was they were like they were so glad that, that that somebody cared about what they did and everything, and and we were so glad because we learned from them, you know, and uh, and the oral traditions. Some, there's a great story about uh, Larry Franklin was one of our great fiddlers, and his uncle, Major Franklin, is like a legendary Texas fiddler. Mark O'Connor would come down uh, when he was 15 and learn from him and everything. And uh, Lewis, uh, Larry's dad was another one. The fiddling Franklins from White Ride, Texas, were famous. And um, the kids would, uh, you know, you'd, you'd be playing, and the kids would be basically studying them. And well, in the middle 60s, something would come up with a tape recorder. <laughs> old major said turn that off <laughs> and he wouldn't let him uh, record him which is a shame he did make some recordings but he wouldn't let him record him because them old cantankerous old guys was that uh, the way they learned it was an oral tradition and, and if you couldn't learn it from that guy then, uh, then you weren't good enough the price of admission was the ability to pick it up you know so times have certainly changed and the technologies have changed completely and everything and think about this you know, uh, at our disposal right now is a hundred and over a hundred years of recorded music, and you can get it on your iPhone. You know. And and so, the way that you that young musicians are going to uh, are approaching um, their creative their creative process is, is now completely different because they they can f they can access information of the past like fingertips. You know, remember who Steve Frommholtz was? Mm -hmm. Okay. You know, Frommholtz is probably in, in the lexicon of music is considered maybe a secondary figure. He's not. But the other day, some kid who had never seen him live and everything is making a documentary movie on him. Interview, interviewed me, interviewed Lyle Lovett the other day, and we were all, because we all love Steve, but it really had sort of not gotten his due as the creative guy he was in his lifetime. And somebody, some kid, heard Steve Frumholtz on the internet and, and has done his incredible research and is going to do it. So, you know, the Whitliff here is going to have all that stuff. I'm sure, that, and I will certainly encourage uh, anybody who has anything of that ilk to, you know, come here because it, it's going to, it'll be an incredible tre treasure trove of, of stuff, you know, to, to listen. Yeah, it's amazing. And and going back, let me ask you this. Let me jump around a little bit. I mean, you were the third, a lot of people may not know, you were the third child in a brood of uh, four siblings, Mike, Sandy, you, and Hank. So what what was the what was the family dynamic like with the kids? I mean, what, what, what can you give me a thumbnail sketch of sort of how it, how it was? Well, 
the, ne the neighbors down the streets uh, said to my mom, we never knew you had four children. All we ever heard was you yelling, Ray, Ray. <laughs> <laughs> that was my mom. So that's what that's what life was like, I guess, you know. But we were my brother and sister. We were great. I mean, we all played music except Hank, the youngest, and he's the Ph.D. in genetic microbiology. <laughs> <laughs> he's brilliant. He's a professor at Northwestern Med School. And he's a brilliant kid, but brilliant man. And um, well, you were one of the angelic members of the four G's, right? Your yeah, my sister group, and me. Right? Yeah, my older brother was my hero. Mike was uh, a fabulous sax player, clarinet player, and musician, and, and, a, and had a rare spinal disease called syringomyelia and became paralyzed um, in, 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 er, uh, later in life. But my sister and I, uh, she was taking guitar lessons with the, some neighbors and brought the guitar home. It was a little four string. And I picked it up and started playing it, and they went, oh, you know how to play this? Well, okay, you go with your sister, and you, you go to those lessons, too. And so they had two other kids there, and so we formed a group, which one of the parents named, the four Gs. Uh, I they were the three Gs, guys, gals, and guitars, but I joined, and so they said four Gs. And, I, and, I, and we had the, the brand of our guitars were these Goya guitars, so they said guys, gals, and Goya guitars. We never did get the deal. <laughs> But we were so cute. We did This Land is Your Land. We, 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 you know, we got square dance outfits from the Sears catalog, orange. <laughs> Burn orange. <laughs> <laughs> and um, we played around. We played you know, places. And then we got noticed by uh, the uh, gu uh, guitar teacher told somebody, and we appeared with the Philadelphia Orchestra in their summer series concerts we sang on top of old Smokey and this land is your land <laughs> and uh, so I so that, and, and I was 10 years old so I, you know and 5,000 people this is you know yeah. a big deal and we were on the cover of the Philadelphia Inquirer Sunday magazine but I what I really don't understand and for some reason I never asked was there are no movies of the four G's or recordings even though we were in a studio and did record and see, my parents were of the ilk that this was like Little League, and you did this, and then you became a, a doctor, lawyer, or something, you know. And, and it, I don't think it, it, because we got offered a record contract, and they turned it down. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, in 1961 uh, or two, and I mean, who does that <laughs> today? Uh, I'm glad, but um, it's kind of funny how that, that, that went. But, you know, I always played, played rock and roll. And, you know. Yeah, I mean, your record collection went from Fats Domino to Pete Seeger. Is that fair to say? At least some of it? Oh, no, I had everything. My first record, the first 45 was Walking to New Orleans by Fats, but um, we had the radio. Like, come on, it was like, uh, one thing I'll say about Philadelphia in the 50s, had the greatest radio. They had the black DJs um, uh, were incredible. Uh, the FM DJs would learn about jazz, and they had folk music, and, and of course, Top 40 had just... You know, that's where I first heard Patsy Cline. I mean, Crazy was the number one pop hit in 61. And, and uh, Ferlin Husky. And so, you know, but we just listened to radio. And, and of course, at night, we would listen uh, because of the skip. And, and, and you'd get uh, WABC from New York, or you could sometimes get uh, uh, New Orleans. And, you know, the, it was, uh, it, it, you just lay there with the radio and uh, go places. And then, in, in, uh, I'm thinking to the to your memoirs, that trip that you took with your parents and your family to, to Europe in 63, where you got a little bit of a whiff of the Beatles, but were also there to sort of, I guess, uh, get in touch with your Jewish yeah, heritage. We had relatives. We had relatives all over Europe. And it was, uh, but Dad went to trade shows. He, he sold uh, uh, machines, that, uh, ticket machines and stuff like that. Pre uh, pre electronic age stuff that did that, um, but yeah, sixty three went. We went to our cousin's house in Bournemouth, uh, southern England, and they said, "Oh, you've got to see right now is is a, a group on TV," and it was juke uh, jukebox jury. It was called, and it was the Beatles. You know, and it was before they come to America, and and of course, you know, all I could I was you know twelve. All I could think of was because we had Brill Cream and Hair Day. 
slicked back like that, and I said, man, look at that stupid hair on those guys. Because <laughs> we're hot, you know. And, um, but my sister and I, we carried our guitars through Europe, and what, in 63, um, Europe was just coming, and, and we went to campgrounds. We had four kids, couldn't afford hotels, so my dad, we had tents, so we went to campgrounds. And everybody in Europe camped anyway. And in 63, it, you could tell there'd been a war there, you know, it was, uh, especially, and then we went to Berlin, because my dad, and we drove through East Germany, and uh, I, I got a real good lesson on why uh, communism wasn't working, because we went into the stores. We weren't allowed to do anything. We were allowed to make one stop, because we drove through. It took six hours to get across the border. And I went in the store, and there was nothing. <laughs> you know, we're used to America, and it was like, like, whoa, East Germany was so desolate. You know. But we would play, um, my sister and I went to campgrounds, we'd pull out guitars and play folk songs, and everybody in Europe, uh, did, they, they, they kind of, and you had like jug band stuff and everything. It was, if you have a guitar and you travel around and can sing and play, you, you can make a lot of friends. You know. And again, I think uh, one of the things that I've learned, you know, I mean, Besides thinking about Ray Benson probably way too much, and any human being should probably have to think about yeah, Ray I Benson. No, but I that. love it. But I love it. You know, you're learning that. I, I mean, you do see where a, a trip like that, even as a kid, would have a an impact. Of, you know, the, the, a lot of the sensitivity and even even um, political views and and, uh, and and your thinking about life. You know, you our know, first yeah, our first bus we bought from a. a company in New Jersey was a trail, you know, one of them trailway sil silver eagles on the back. It said, learn to travel, travel to learn. <laughs> <laughs> Smart. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, David Mincone says hello, you know, the, your co-writer, co -writer, yeah. the man who helped, music journalist and author, and he helped Fantastic to organize. Fantastic writer. The, yeah, the, uh, really great book. But he said that, you know, he, he came, he remembers when he was a UT student, and just thought, again, thought of Asleep at the Wheel as a, you know, a great dance band, good time band, you know, where the kids would, would hang out. As he got into your story and then helping, you know, you had written the manuscript and he organized it and did further interviews. You know, he, he does, you know, he brought a lot of depth to it, but he also, you know, he, he was telling me just this last week that one of the things he realized through your life story is that it is a, a snapshot of the American dream at that time because it really does, it's a, it's a story of uh, uh, not only having goals and you know chasing after the dreams, but also reinvention. I don't th I don't think you know I, that's why I brought up that question about you know the struggles of the early days because you know for some groups it could have just ended there. If people are leaving, you know you could have just said forget it. Yeah, no, it. it um, my mom always said I was stubborn and just <laughs> didn't give up, and uh, that's probably true. But uh, the other thing was. Um, the, every, every, you know, in 1982, uh, three, it was getting kind of dismal. I think I looked at my tax return, and, and uh, when when my son Sam was born, I made twenty thousand bucks in '83, <laughs> and like everybody was making money flipping in San Marcos in real estate. Everybody was flipping money. It was like, and I mean, I'd had a top ten hit record, had won a Grammy award, had the thing, was, and and I was thinking of. I was like, oh, what am I going to do? You know, the bus was always breaking down. But literally every week somebody, you know, said, man, this is, we'd have a great show. And these people would say, this is incredible. Nobody does this. Man, don't ever stop. You know, it was like, it's like, and all of a sudden, you know, it was like, okay, you know, we, we, we you know. And also I, it was at that point that, and I had I had to build a band as Ray Benson of the Sleep at the Wheel because the three female vocalists that had been with us before and the other two male vocals had been with us were gone and I was going, well, who's going to show up? So if I say uh, Ray Benson, see with the will, then, then <laughs> at least it'll be clear who's coming, you know. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> so that worked really well because it, it became, you know, okay. The hardest problem with the to will was having too many vocalists. Really, Chris O'Connell, one of the greatest female right. singers, Leroy Preston, incredible songwriter, uh, you know. And so the record come out and they go, uh, the Johnny Walker was her singing and me singing and it was like the next record was totally different and who is this? And so it was a kind of an identity crisis. So by the 80s, I got to kind of coalesce the band and 
but reinventing is what it is. Every 10 years, you got another generation, um, and you got to figure out how to how to either stay with your generation or whatnot. You know, uh, in the 70s, uh, our our fans went out every day of the week. Uh, in the 80s, they started only going out on the weekends and going to uh, county fairs, state fairs, etc. You know, and now you know uh, we play old age homes. No. <laughs> No, <laughs> that was a joke. Yeah, David also brought up another <coughs> good point, and I totally agree, and I think, I mean, it can only happen because it did happen that way, but he can't imagine a, a sleep at the wheel coming up at any different time. He thought that the time was right, yeah. even though, you know, you don't neatly fit into that progressive country mold. You really never fit into any, you know, wave, but at least it was a toehold, you know, you could get in, but, but it, was, it was the right time. You know, there was a lot of bands with uh, funny names at that time and big bands and, and people doing hybrid music. Yeah, you know, it was. We had uh, Marshall Tucker, they were good pals of mine, and uh, the Charlie Daniels Marshall Tucker Bunch, they were, they were really compatible with us and good friends of ours and, and collaborators, you know, and then the other side, Willie Nelson and, and, and the Texas guys, you know. Um, that, that was, again, the, the whole thing about Sleep at the Wheel, when we moved to town, we could play at the Armadillo or Soap Creek or anything, and then we also went down to San Antonio and played The Farmer's Daughter, which was the, 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 uh, the redneck dance hall with an eight-foot picture of Bob Wills behind the stage, and, you know, it was, uh, you had to do the Cotton Eye Joe, the Shottish, and the Put Your Little Foot, and, the, you know, the, the, the way the, the Texas used to be, and, and the Paul Jones with a whistle. Am I talking this thing you understand? You know? yeah. <laughs> It's so funny because you know it's, uh, 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 those days are literally gone. I mean, there's uh, even the broken spoke. They wouldn't dare do a Paul Jones. Paul Jones is where the women in the center and the men on the uh, and, and they play and you all work. And when they blow the whistle, you dance with who you're in front of. And uh, you know, w w when the Paul Jones and alcohol mix, boy, I'll tell you what, there's some <laughs> good fights. <laughs> but I mean, yeah. So the Texas dance hall thing was uh, was so important and so the ability for us to do that was another way reason we could survive well and we would play dance halls all over texas um you know and and, and love it and there's a there's a way to do them and we would sneak in as opposed to us playing the modern jukebox or country western songs you know we would substitute that but at least we would have the right amount of, of rhythm stuff for them to dance to you know you had to play pop a top you had to play um, you know the Johnny Bush stuff and the Ray Price stuff, and and uh, and so then when we come back and play the uh, uh, rock joints, you have to structure your show a little differently. It's a, for a big stage show. It's not for a dance where they're dancing in a circle and doing the cotton eye, you know, the shotters, etc. You know, at one time, the '66th anniversary of Route 66, we toured from Chicago to L.A. on a commemorative tour on Route 66, and um, w we would stop on all the way and, and everything. And there was a new group, Brooks and Dunn, you know, multi-platinum, big-time country western, but they were just starting, they were friends of mine, and I had them open, us, open the show for us in Amarillo. And it was a big dance, and uh, they finished their set, because they just had one hit records, you know. And they were on the thing, and they were on the bus, and I went in to see them, and they were all like, oh man, nobody clapped after us, we do, we do. I said, you, they loved you. They danced. <laughs> they don't clap in Amarillo. They haven't taught them how to do that. <laughs> and uh, I said, "You're." They loved you. They danced. You know. And so it, it's, it was just a totally different thing. And um, but it's why we were able to uh, to prosper, uh, not prosper, but keep our heads above water. Well, it made you yeah. impervious to trends, right? You do your thing. No one really does the sleep at the wheels thing. And uh, yeah, see, like we were, like when I was when I got here, you know, I'm 23 years old. Um, so the kids in college were our were our peers, and so the thing. But but you know, when I'm when I'm 40 years old, uh, the college kids don't want to hear you. You know, <laughs> so, or some do, but you know, you're not the hot thing on campus. You know, so. Uh, you just got transition, and um, and it uh, a lot of people can't. I mean, I, 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 Willie Nelson's been such a good friend and, and, and a mentor uh, on what to do and what not to do. But you know, he, I, you could see his career. I saw him. You know, where uh, there was a time when Willie really, you know, twenty years or so ago was was not doing as well as perhaps you would think that a legend should have. But he figured out 
his way of getting back into the mainstream, and uh, and that's what you got to do. You know, besides your like like I stay, said earlier, you know, you know, I mean, just so, so many of the gigs I've seen you at, but also the ones I know you've played that are just, you know, super big time, huge audiences. I mean, is the contribution that you've made? I mean, it's probably tough for the artist to answer this. Um, as much about the music, I mean, as much about being an ambassador for Texas and Western Swing and this sort of uh, lifestyle or life music that we're talking about. Because it would have, I mean, without a sleep at the wheel, I can't, you know, there's not that many purveyors of this No, no, tradition. there's nobody. There's nobody with a, a large band out there doing it, you know, with a band over four pieces. There's people playing Western Swing all over America in different varieties, but to get, you know, eight or nine, or seven, eight or nine people out on the road every night at a different town, no, that's, that's, that's not hard, that's not, uh, you either do the time jumpers in Nashville, they have a sit down gig, a great band that Vince Gill would sit in with uh, occasionally, and, and uh, the, the Hot Club of Cowtown is a trio that does their version of Western Swing, which is three of them, you know, we do, we're a big band, and that's expensive, logistically very difficult, and uh, hard to get that many people to pull at the same right. time. You know. It's called paying your dues, right? I mean, over and over again, so many times. Um, let me ask you, you joked about not being the tortured artist, but you know, Ray's solo albums, I, I think they're incredible, especially uh, the second one I thought was just amazing. I mean, you've written beautiful, moving, dare I say, sensitive songs, you know, like a, a little piece. Um, where do those, where do you, for the artist, where do those solo f records fit in with regard to, you know, the business model or just uh, personal satisfaction for you? Uh, well, you know, Sleep at the Wheel is a concept. It was, the concept was to do this stuff. You know, this is the concept and it's a box. It's, you were going to fit into this box. It's a pretty cool and a pretty big box. It's not narrow, but it's a box and, it, and you know, there's things that I really shouldn't do on st either on the record or on stage uh, uh, under the name of Sleep at the Wheel because you know it's just it's just not going to work. Um, so that's why I was able to do a solo out solo albums because uh, songwriting there's you know there's uh, in my mind there's two 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 or three ways to write songs. One either you got a uh, you know uh, you have an assignment. Hey, we need we need, uh, or maybe you're working on a film score, or maybe you're working on a concept album. Hey, I need a I need a song, I need a swing song, or I need a ballad, or anything that fits this thing, and you go and write it. And that's the craft of writing songs. But then, it, um, then then there's songwriting where you're sitting there and you and and it's your therapy, you know, and it's your um, and it's your artistic uh, muse that happens, and that is just. Whatever comes out is what's there, and so you can't. Um, so, uh, and sometimes that doesn't fit into the the uh, box that you're doing, so whether it's in the Sleep at the Wheel or whether it's Ray Benson or whether it's whatever. And those are the songs that I got to do on the album, and, and they were total commercial flops. And <laughs> but how receptive <laughs> are your true are your diehard fans to that? I mean, I do you measure it only not, that no, way I don't know. I don't know, man. You know, it, I, I think, uh, well, I'll tell you what, as uh, Sam will tell you, is uh, uh, dollar-wise, if you try to book Ray Benson, he gets a whole lot less than Asleep at the Wheel. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you're a pretty driven individual. Would you call yourself a workaholic? Oh, no, no. Well, you have to define work, you know. <laughs> But no, I I I I work all the time. Uh, if, if that, but 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 it's I would be doing it if 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 I wasn't getting paid. You know. So uh, yeah, that's. Show us your new one with Lyle, or show us whatever. You, do it. Do us one here, Ray. If I can remember. I've been talking too much. Yeah, this one started out like this. I'm sitting on the porch. Here. There you go again, there you go again. Red lips to get dyed blonde hair, saying hi with a dramatic flair. Off to Europe on a wing and a prayer. There you go again, 
There you go again. There you go again. Chasing Sally around the bend. Thinking no one else is listening. Wasting all your time and attention. There you go again. There you go around the roses. Chasing old Sally again. They go on a tightrope. Balancing in the wind. They go sending Ben Moe's people you don't know. They go quoting Shakespeare. You never read him, this I know. They go again. They go again. Throwing caution to the wind. Going to Vegas on a whim. Blowing all your hard earned money. There you go again. This is where the fiddle plays. Take it to the bridge. Woke up Sunday morning, looking for a place to land. Back in business Monday, looking for a helping hand. Helps a distant memory, lost long time ago. Lost the one and only one you should not have let go. There you go again. There you go again. <laughs> Trying to make amends. With all of your high-class friends Never really dealing with your feelings There you go again And then the band takes over Trumpets, kazoos, electric guitars, steel guitars, fiddles, everything So I think I'll better just end this <laughs> Woo, yeah! Well, Thank you I know better than to follow that. I just want to say, Ray, thank you so much for being here at the Whitliff Collections. This event very much uh, was sort of, a, sort of a, a big thank you for those archives for all those years and to remind people of uh, the fantastic exhibition that is here at the Whitliff this Collections is, uh, until wonderful. January 30th. So we feel like we're breaking the champagne bottle on that hull of that boat. And saying, come on and see it. And uh, once I again, I can't thank you enough, and Sally and Bill Whitliff, who uh, mean so much to me. And thank you for uh, for uh, for doing this because this is something that's going to last for many, many years. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Ray. Thank you, everyone here too.